Okay, it's just hit 1.33, so I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everybody to uh, day three of GW4 uh, Open Research Week 2023. Um, this is a series of uh, workshops, seminars, uh, demonstrations and other events all around the theme of, of open research. Um, uh, I'll just pop a link in the chat there. It's still time to sign up for um, events that are happening later in the week, including the Open Research Prize event, which is uh, tomorrow afternoon. Um, this is online, um, so you don't need to commit to going anywhere in person. Um, but for uh, uh, this afternoon's event, um, I am very pleased to welcome uh, Colin Yang and Isabella Macedo de Lucas, um, who are uh, postgraduate researchers here at the University of Bristol. Um, in the School of Psychology and the School of uh, Sociology, Politics and International Studies. Um, and they're going to be talking about a six part um, sort of discussion seminar series um, that they ran earlier this year, looking at the uh, challenges and the complexities of um, open research, uh, particularly qualitative open research, uh, working with uh, vulnerable research participants. So I'll hand over to uh, Isabella and Colin now. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sosia. Thanks everyone for being here today. Um, yeah, so just Colin, you can pass the slide, please. Um, yeah, so just an overview what, of what we are going to present today. Um, so first we will kind of contextualize uh, a bit of open science and qualitative research. We will also give you a description of the aims of our events and everything we did um, earlier this year. And we will provide some uh, findings. So um, as you will see later, we, each session of our events had focus, um, specific focuses and uh, the sessions, they ended up bringing different reflections each time. So we will provide you some summary of that. Um, also the audience feedback and some discussion and suggested actions for the future. Um, yes, you can put in the other slide, please. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Zosia, and uh, for everyone to uh, be here. Yeah, so I'm going to start with uh, sort of like how we... Um, um, had this idea in the first place and how, like, what kind of aims that we had in mind uh, to organize this um, event. So, so basically, uh, at the first, we sort of thinking, I was sort of think about, like, how we, uh, um, you know, we had a lot of, like, information and we had learned a lot, a lot about, like, open science and open research practice and we heard a lot of uh, practice and, like, discussion around it. Uh, but we noticed that we, all the discussions are not focused on, first of all, uh, on qualitative research and also uh, not on qualitative research with vulnerable participants. Um, and then, and also based on our own sort of um, research interests, um, my research is in, is focused on queer studies and uh, um, sort of like LGBTQ communities and Isa's, Isabella's uh, research is focused on uh, decolonization. So uh, we had this idea of um, organizing this event and sort of like open this discussion around doing open research in qualitative research with uh, vulnerable participants. So um, these are the aims that we had in mind. The first is we want to uh, encourage transparency, openness, and democratization of the scientific process in all stages of qualitative research. And uh, we also want to promote interdisciplinary discussions and knowledge exchanges. We also want to promote ethical awareness and discussions about open science in qualitative research with vulnerable participant, participants. And in particular, we want to focus on um, and bring out the voices of scholars from underrepresented backgrounds. And also we want to sort of uh, bridge the voices of academics and non-academics um, 
So in our organization later on, we, uh, in, for each of our session, we invited people from uh, you know, communities with lived experiences who are non-academics to join our discussion. Um, and then specifically, uh, each, of, each of our sessions focused on different um, specific themes um, about uh, a specific marginalized group. Um, so here is some basic organization of our um, workshop sessions. So we had uh, sort of six online sessions um, and which uh, lasted 1.5 hours. And then we had at the end of uh, uh, all six online sessions, we had a uh, offline workshop uh, hosted in University of Bristol. Uh, with three different uh, speakers and one facilities for a workshop. Um, and then in, for each of the uh, online sessions, we, like I said before, we invited um, academics, people who are doing uh, or had experience doing open research with one of our participants. And also uh, with the specific theme in mind, we invited uh, uh, people who are from the community uh, to uh, bring with them their own uh, live, lived experiences and voices. And then, yeah, and the, all, uh, this project is uh, was supported by Research in Glens and Hence uh, Research Culture Seed Corn funding. And also we had um, the a great pleasure to have a lot of support from our supervisors, from uh, you know the uh, uh, new uh, Jacobs from UKRN, and we also had a lot of support from people uh, from the communities from and from each sector that we um uh, worked with. Yeah, so before we present some of the findings and uh, how the sessions went, went um, I would just like to touch a little bit on the contextualization of our, uh, our rationale for conducting these events. Um, so often the conversations about open science, they focus on uh, the, the reproducibility crisis. Uh, for example, the UNESCO recommendation on open science um, encouraged people to share data, uh, calls for transparency and data sharing. And we all have that, especially in psychology, the area I am from, we have a lot of push to do that nowadays. Um, but often qualitative research ends up being sidelined in, in this discussion because reproducibility, for example, is, not often, is often not an aim of qualitative research and we have quite sensitive data and very identifiable data. So um, it's something else to think about. And then um, literature discusses that data sharing policies and practices, they are usually based on quantitative research standards. Um, but for qualitative research, there is no one size fits all as it's easier to do that with quantitative research, for example. Because in the qualitative research, understanding the process of analysis can be more important or as important of sharing the data, because just sharing the data doesn't allow the uh, other researchers to understand uh, what you did. And therefore, as qualitative researchers, uh, how can we make decisions uh, regarding open science? Should we open our data? Should we not? only sharing data is enough to call it open science and qualitative research, or especially when dealing and when researching with marginalized communities, is it ethical to share data? So there were a bunch of questions in our minds um, that we discussed with our speakers throughout the whole process. You can pass the slide, uh, you can jump to the next one, because I think you covered that. Yeah, you can pass this one. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, uh, we talked about that we had um, a specific focus on each session, but we didn't say exactly the focus. 
So in the first session, we just contextualized, um, we, we uh, invited speakers to contextualize open, open research. Um, in the second session, we had a focus on doing research with LGBTQ plus populations. In the session three, we focused on doing research alongside with people with disabilities. In the session four, it was about doing open research with refugee and migrant communities. Session five, we had um, about open research in mental distress. In the session six, we had the workshop in person. Oh no, session six, we had um, with survivors of gendered violence. And in the session seven, which is the in-person workshop we did, we had interdisciplinary explorations about qualitative uh, open science and qualitative research. So invited um, researchers from different backgrounds, such as medicine um, and sociology and so on to discuss about it. Um, yeah, and then we had, here are the posters that we used for our, um, for our advertisements. These are our speakers. Zosia that is here today was one of our speakers in our first session to contextualize and talk about the University of Bristol policies for sharing sensitive data, sensitive qualitative research data. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Um, okay. So now going to our findings, um, the first session we had, as I said, was about contextualizing open research. And what we found, uh, what was discussed, not what we found, but what was discussed in this session, we had Zosia and uh, Dr. Amy Russell um, discussing about this. And what, the, what Amy discussed was there is such a diversity of qualitative research. When we say open research in qualitative um, methods, we cannot even think about one type of research because there are so many different types um, and also epistemologies. And then qualitative data sharing can be identifiable data. So a lot of researchers nowadays, uh, qualitative researchers, they are um, trying to propose different things. So for example, um, it doesn't, the, the data sharing qualitative research can be more specific, so it's not at all or nothing. Share all of your transcripts or nothing. We can maybe share codes, we can share some um, interview transcripts and others not. It depends on the nature of the data. It doesn't have to be online for everyone to see. It can be uh, more controlled. Um, and of course, one thing that was discussed a lot in this session was the need for ethical permission. But we have to be careful because there is a conflict with journal policies. So qualitative researchers are discussing all of these specificities, but often journals policies don't consider uh, these complexities. And with vulnerable participants, it becomes even more uh, complicated because um, what Amy discussed, Amy is from a health background, she's from a med that medicine background, and she discussed a lot in this session about how a lot of people from the general public, they don't feel connected to research, they don't feel connected to universities, so there is a lot of trust issues between participants and researchers, especially participants from historically marginalized communities. So how are we going to negotiate with them the fact that they're telling a story to us and we will say, okay, this story will be for everyone to see. How can we ensure that that will be safe for them and that they actually understand the, the procedure of sharing data because it's something that can be quite complex to understand. How can we get a consent for that? And then what Zosia discussed in her uh, presentation was about how the University of Bristol, for example, has a policy of doing first a risk assessment and pre-publication checks to ensure uh, con consent and coherence and assessing all the potential risks to try to alleviate them. And 
something that they discuss and that will be more elaborated in the following sessions that you will, as you will see, is the importance of co-produce co guidance and early support. So uh, the importance to get participants to produce this guidance with you and to have early support from, for example, research technicians and people that actually know about this when you are thinking of sharing your data. Okay, uh, moving on to our second session, uh, which is doing open research with LGBTQ plus communities. Um, we have two amazing guests for this one. Uh, the first one is Rosie Nelson. Um, they are a uh, lecturer in gender in um, space at the University of Bristol. And now we had Ibtism Ahmed. Uh, he is the head of policy and research in LGBTQ Foundation. Uh, here in the UK, which is a uh, non-governmental organization. Um, and in, like the main takeaway from this session is this. So in open research with, with LGBTQ plus communities, it is crucial to prioritize inclusivity, listen to communities, and co-produce research in order to ensure ethical communications and safeguarding of participants, as well as to create inclusive and impactful research. Um, and here again, we can see uh, the emphasis on co-production, uh, like Isa mentioned before. And in the talk, uh, basically there are there are two major parts. The first part is um, they open the talk with the definition of openness. What is open in uh, when we're talking about open research or open science practice? Um, and in their talk, they, they say, well, if we want to open, or if we want to understand openness, we can uh, approach it through three different ways. The first is we can look at what is open data. And then the second is we can look at what is open publications. And then the third is what is open findings. Um, um, and then based on these three different things, we have different approaches and different considerations. Um, and also in regard to the specific focus of the group and of the people, uh, we have different ways to do or to practice open science, which we will talk about later. Um, and then uh, to be more specific, openness in research with LGBTQ plus communities is not just about sharing data, but also uh, about engaging with uh, ethical and trustworthy conduct of research. And this to be more specific uh, is the sort of like the debate of doing research with uh, LGBT plus people and the ethical consideration in contrast to the institutionalized ethical procedures that researchers need to submit when they're trying to conduct um, research with LGBTQ plus people. Because for uh, oftentimes there are a lot of obstacles um, in their ethical procedure. And then uh, they have, uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of queer researchers have encountered a lot of like obstacles uh, when they're submitting their ethical uh, application or they're when they're debating uh, about what a research is allowed or should be done or should not. Okay. Um, and the second thing that is very important, which is the, um, the consideration. Um, so especially Rosie uh, has considered this um, from very different, from all uh, different perspectives. The first is uh, from the, data perspective, uh, the queer data um, or the data from LGBTQ plus people, uh, if they're exposed, is there going to be a uh, danger of them being targeted? And uh, these kind of violence could be in different forms, for example, online violence or uh, privacy violation um, or even uh, safety in real life, because if they are uh, 
able to be identified by, for example, um, haters, um, they might be targeted in real life and experience violence. And the second thing is uh, the misinterpretation and difficulty in uh, reinterpretation of the data. And that's, that is closely connected to uh, situatedness, which is uh, very often talked about in uh, sort of queer qualitative research. Because when we're doing research with LGBTQ plus people, uh, it is often uh, very individual oriented and situation oriented. So for a lot of the type, uh, for a lot of the times, the conversation um, is based on a very specific context. And then uh, when you're opening or sharing that data with other people uh, and people who were not in that conversation might misinterpret uh, what the speaker has said in the conversation, or there might be difficulties if you want to use it as a secondary source of data, then uh, there might be difficulties in reinterpreting what the um, interviewees uh, said in the original conversation. And the third concern is, uh, is queer data too queer for the database? Um, and one thing uh, our speaker mentioned was that uh, it's because uh, queer data and queer research for most of the time is very um, sort of emotion-based and effect-based. Um, and then a lot of the data are uh, sort of presented in a very non-traditional way. And then, uh, and again, considering uh, a lot of queer researchers are using queer methodologies, which uh, are but most of the time very creative and, in and innovative in its form and its collecting pro process, then that data uh, would be hard to be considered in a traditional sense. And, included in the database. Uh, and the next point is connected to this, which is queer methodologies for a lot of times are based on different purposes. And then even uh, approaching for the same conversation and for the same question, then using different, met using different methods might uh, sort of uh, lead to a different goal of the research. Um, and the fifth point is also similar to uh, the uh, misinterpretation of the data, which is um, queer research is uh, very, very heavily context dependent. Uh, and then our next session, which is the third session, uh, is doing open research with people with disabilities. And for this session, our guests uh, are Elizabeth and Chris Cook. Uh, Eliz Elizabeth is a professor in psychology from the um, University of, uh, no, from the University, uh, St the Pennsylvania State University. Um, and then Chris Cook uh, is a postgraduate researcher in um, transportation. Um, and then the main takeaway from this session is it is important to shift our attention to the context and environment that greatly influence the lives of people with disabilities, challenge stereotypes, and consider positive outcomes in research involving uh, people with disabilities. And in this session, uh, in, in this session, uh, our speakers approach it in a very uh, approach to topic with very like nuanced approach. Uh, the first day is people with disabilities are often overlooked in clinical psychology, but it, it is important to shift our attention to the context environment that greatly influence their lives as disability is not a defining characteristic and the medical model focus on limitations rather than choice. And in contrast to the medical model mentioned in this one, uh, both of our speakers talked about uh, social model of disability, which I will elaborate later on. 
And the second point is the importance of shifting our attention from the individual uh, to the context and environment that greatly influence a person's life. And then again, it is a very nuanced, a very different way of looking at disability, which is not just looking at the people or the individual themselves, but looking at the their environment and the um, sort of their surroundings they're living uh, in and with. So here is the uh, explanations for the social model versus medical model. Um, in the medical model, disability is often seen as the defining characteristic of individuals. Um, and then their, their disability is that the most important uh, part of their lives. It's who they are. Uh, it's uh, you know what determines what they can and cannot do. But um, the social model, uh, in contrast, focuses more on their experiences and then uh, on their surroundings and their interactions with the surroundings. So uh, parents and adolescents with physical uh, disabilities reported positive experiences, challenging the perception of disability as tragedy. And the social model of disability emphasizes in the importance of considering positive outcomes and challenging stereotypes in research involving people with, the, with disabilities. And then uh, the other importance of social model of disability is that it challenges medically oriented research by promoting health and resilience, focusing on chronic phases of disability, incorporating those being researched into the process and examining the social, political, economic, and legal problems of disability. It also challenges stereotypes perpetuated by research and emphasizes the importance of considering positive outcomes, multiple variables, and underlying assumptions when designing studies involving people with disabilities. So these are the, some of the very important aspects of the social model of disability. And in practice, what we should do, or well, not, well, uh, and as our speaker said in our session, uh, the first is uh, when we're considering doing open science, we need to uh, carefully consider methods and sample selection when conducting research with people with disabilities, including using a checklist to gather information, evaluating findings, and respecting individual preferences in language. And uh, both our speakers attach great importance in the use of language. Um, and they, they also give us uh, several specific uh, examples of what people like and do not like to hear um, in order to sort of, uh, as a reference to their own disability. So uh, when in, in this consideration, we need to use neutral language and should not prefer people with disabilities as a collective group. And it is important to recognize and understand the complexities of non-visible disabilities. A third part also uh, is about language, which is we need to focus on person first language and empathy when working with people with disabilities, share impairment to encourage openness, data collection, requires careful consideration of confidentiality and anonymization. And here are some of their suggestions uh, in practice. The first is, um, oh, sorry. Uh, this one is about like, because one of our guest speaker, Chris, uh, he himself, is a, is blind, and then he had uh, a lot of experience doing um, research around disabilities and also with people with disabilities. So he mentioned that being a disabled researcher can provide unique insights and rich data set, but uh, non-disabled researchers can also obtain valuable data by following guidelines, building trust, and being prepared. 
And then to be more specific, uh, doing research with visually impaired people uh, and recruiting, for example, if you recruit uh, more visually impaired people for study may unintentionally neglect other disability groups. And it is important to be aware of this during the recruitment process of the research. And then again, the social model of disability emphasizes that people are disabled by their environment rather than their own impairments. And then at the end, we can see there is a great example of how environment uh, could impact people with disabilities. Yeah, so in our fourth session, we focus in refugee and immigrant communities. Um, we had Nor um, Dr. Marcia Vera and Caio Seha. Um, Marcia is a very experienced research researcher in about this topic, and Caio is a um, is a human rights worker. He works for different organizations of human rights and immigrant rights. Um, so what they focused on, um, a lot of things overlapped with the, um, we realized that a lot of things overlapped between the sessions. For example, they started the session um, by talking about how open research goes beyond open data, as Kali was saying uh, before for the LGBT session. So it has to be an open, process alongside the marginalized communities that you are working with. So research should be open and transparent, not only for academics and funders, as we talk about data sharing, we talk about, we talk about it to share with other academics, right? But when doing research with marginalized communities, it is important that the participants themselves and the members of the community being studied also can access the data, also can access the findings of the research. So it is necessary to make the whole process accessible for them. Um, they emphasize how it is important to prioritize safety, private, privacy, and well-being when working with refugees and migrants. Um, so they reflected on how we have to take steps to minimize potential harm, exploitation, risks, while also presenting findings in an accessible and culturally appropriate formats. So I remember Marcia even gave the example uh, that, for example, a lot of NGOs and people that want to call attention for the cause of human rights um, of refugees and, and migrants, they often share data, a lot of sensitive data, a lot of sensitive photos, a lot of sensitive stories. They often share that to um, kind of get a, a attention from, from people to the problem that is being done there. And how in, this has to be very carefully considered in research because we don't want to repeat something like that. We need to be very, um, very, very careful on how we are portraying that data. And of course, uh, a phrase here that they they talked about was don't talk about migrants without migrants. So uh, we can make the whole research process and we can have all the considerations. But what we really need is to have a co-production with refugee and migrant communities, researchers and participants to make sure that all of the processes that we are taking make sense, are culturally appropriate. Uh, Caio even mentioned in this session about uh, having cultural brokers, breakers, brokers, I'm not sure about the term, but it's always having a person with lived experience advising you in your research, especially, for example, when you are uh, trying to get thoughts or consent on data sharing, you have to have people with lived experience so you can make sure that your language of sharing data is being understood and it's being, um, people are actually consenting to what you, what you are saying. Um, and of course, being flexible to necessary adaptations. 
So for example, if you have in your mind that, yeah, sharing the whole transcript, sharing the whole data is the best idea possible, but the community are saying to you, we don't want that, or um, yeah, the, the advisors of the lived experience uh, with lived experience are saying that this doesn't make sense to the community. Uh, you have to be flexible and be open to understand that um, not all the time the researcher knows best. Um, so yeah, you have to be considered of that. And as I was saying before, uh, an, an emphasis on this co-production um, with communities is very important and also to help to decolonize knowledge production and promote more inclusive research processes, especially in this area of research that is focused on marginalized communities. Uh, you can pass the slide, please. Um, so on our fifth session, we focused on uh, doing research in mental about mental distress. Uh, we had Jackie and Sonia uh, delivering the session. They are from uh, an organization called the Survivor Network. They provide the lived experience advice uh, to researchers. I think Sonia was a uh, lived experience advisor it's in King's College London, something like that, I'm not sure. Um, so they emphasized in this session um, something very overlapping again with what we were hearing before in the other sessions, which is the power dynamics in the research process and how it needs to be reevaluated, especially in institutions like mental health institutions, like health institutions that have inherent biases and inequalities. So research on mental distress and data sharing has to be, as we said before several times, has to ensure that the consent has been given for the exact thing that you're doing. Um, and you have to create a trust um, and allyship with the community that you are researching. So with uh, the people that you are uh, researching with. So instead of this false dichotomy between uh, us, the researchers, and them, the people with mental distress, um, we actually, in, in this case of mental distress, we should um, not think like that because we are all capable of experiencing mental distresses in our lives. So we all, to some extent, have a lived experience of this, although we all have, it, have that in different levels. So um, it, this, the decision making in the research process becomes something more collaborative. And the, the notion of ownership of the researcher over their research has to be uh, changed and reevaluated. Uh, so yeah, the decision processes ends up being shared. The, the, the decisions over the research processes ends up being shared between the collaborators. And they talked a lot about this concept of survivor research um, because they talked about it in a way that is different from the traditional user involvement in research, the PPI um, paradigm, because it's not only about having kind of a consultation or participation of the, of the participants and communities in research process, but it is actually giving power to them over that, those decisions, uh, giving the survivors the control over the research process and the decision. So if it is to share data, it, this decision has to come from the community. And um, yeah, and this is as well a way of challenging the psychiatry psychiatric system because uh, often um, yeah they people in the psychiatry system the patients they don't have the power over the decisions they don't have the power they don't have the the power to understand and decide and then this is kind of a challenge to this system so basically they emphasize the importance of lived experiences again as we were seeing before in the other sessions um, but including individuals with lived experiences, not only as collaborators, but as researchers. And they gave an idea in the session that would be the peer support groups. So it would be the peer support groups as a point of discussion about research that is being conducted in that institution or something like that. So. Uh, 
Okay, um, our last session uh, focuses on doing open research with uh, survivors of gendered violence. Um, and then in summary, this session focuses on addressing violence against women requires openness, collaboration, participant agency, and again, co-production, uh, contextual understanding and prioritizing the well-being of both participants and researchers. Um, and especially the last point uh, is uh, it's a very important takeaway from the session. And this session, uh, in this session, we had uh, three speakers. Uh, we had Jane Nongdu, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher at South African uh, Medical Research Council. And, and then we had um, Dr. Andy Gibbs, who is a uh, senior lecturer at the uh, University of Exeter. And then we have Rosa Target, who uh, is a research associate at space at the University of Bristol, but also um, she has done a, re a lot of research on uh, with, done, on and with uh, women that has uh, suffered and survived from gender violence. Um, so uh, they, all of them had, uh, you know, great insights. The first, uh, thing that's very important from the session is that researchers and survivors of gender violence uh, grapple with the challenge of sharing data while protecting confidentiality, emphasizing the importance of participant agency, co-production, creating a receptive space for sharing stories and knowledges. Um, uh, and then the second is the complexities of open research on gender based violence, including issues of representation, conceptualization of violence, research methods, reflexivity and well-being, while also providing a content warning about discussing personal experience of violence without graphic detail. Um, so these are the sort of like the uh, suggestions that they uh, gave um, to people who are doing research with um, survivors of gender violence. And then um, the last point they mentioned was the uh, sort of, we need to look at the complexities of what is violence. Um, when we talk about violence, we need to be aware that there are different layers of, viol uh, of violence. For example, uh, Violence includes physical violence, state inflicted violence, microaggressions, and then as well as all different forms uh, of violence will have very harmful impacts on individuals and communities. And then in sort of in practice, uh, when we're doing research with survivors of gender violence, there are uh, often two major neglected areas. The first is, uh, in order to create a safe and receptive environment for survivors of gender violence, it is important to have a gender specific space where participants feel comfortable and safe, as well as ensuring a power balance in the room. And this uh, in particular applies to, for example, um, you know, interviews or focus group, uh, our speakers talked about uh, situations where, um, from both sides actually, uh, one side is that they have seen the participants feel, um, felt really comfortable uh, being with other survivors in a group setting and talking about uh, their own, uh, their histories and talk about their traumas and sharing very emotional moments with each other. On the other hand, they talk about in some occasions, uh, while there are, uh, for example, a power imbalance between uh, the participants uh, within the participants, and then people were sort of, sort of reluctant to share their stories and to share their emotions. Uh, 
And the second uh, neglected area is that participants in co-production processes, particularly young people in complex situations, need time to develop their ability to think and reflect on their lives before engaging in formal collaboration as they may struggle to imagine alternative, uh, better futures. Um, this is something we uh, really talk about when we're talking about doing research with survivor gender violence, um, because a lot of times when we are when we start doing research, we start uh, recruiting our participants. We don't really give a lot of consideration to the mental preparation for the process. And for a lot of the people, um, yeah, we can uh, get really good uh, so-called data from them. We can have a lot of good insights from our conversation, but we also need to be aware that in order to um, sort of have a um, solid and have a uh, sort of good data from uh, our participants, we need to allow them the time to mentally prepare for the conversation and for um, the research they, they would be participating. Oh, another thing I forgot to put here was the um, thing that I mentioned earlier, which is the well-being of both participants and researchers. Uh, this point was specifically uh, coming from Rosa uh, because she has done a lot of research and also uh, held a lot of like um, events on the sort of mental well-being of the res researchers uh, who are doing research uh, on uh, gender violence or other uh, sensitive um, topics. And then she had witnessed a lot of like researchers who had suffered um, mental distress or um, depression uh, because of doing because of doing the research. Um, so she attached great importance on uh, focusing also on the mental well-being of people who are doing the research. Yeah, so just to kind of summarize uh, the most, what we think are the most important findings of our sessions. And I think we forgot to say in the beginning, but the sessions are available if you look um, on YouTube. So are, they are publicly available. You can watch them if you wish to. Um, you just look open the unopenable in you, on YouTube and you can find all the sessions there. Um, but yeah, the first thing we thought about was how these sessions, they ended up expanding and having much more than we expected and anticipated before. So for example, we thought that the speakers would just come and talk about how we can do open science with this marginalized communities. But in the end, we had more questions than answers. So for example, what even is open science and qualitative research, especially with marginalized participants? So all of the all of the sessions basically were focusing on is the research available to the communities? Is this re is this open research considering the perspectives of the community? Is it being ac accessible to them? Um, and then, yeah, research should be transparent and accessible to members of the community you are researching. So including them in the discussions about their own stories, because in qualitative research, often they are telling us their stories. Um, and we are interpreting based on that those stories. So are we actually uh, considering their perspectives on our interpretations? Are we having a complete transparent process with the participants as well? And the fact that oftentimes this is a battle with institu institutionalized ethics. So a lot of the, of, of the researchers that were speakers in our events, they talked a lot about how the institutional ethics, only the checklists and guidelines, they are often not sufficient to cover uh, the empathy and the holistic view of the ethics on this type of research. So the focus, was especially on the necessity of co-production. 
So if you want to share data, if you want to do open science in this type of research, you need to build trust. You need to have a clear communication. You need to have an informed consent that is not only asking the participant, oh, do you want to share data? And they don't know what that means, but they say, yes, sure, because they trust you. No, make sure that the participant know what is data sharing, for what purposes, how they, how they might be affected by it and have an input um, on how to do it in the best way. So respecting agency, authority and autonomy of participants, they are owners of their own stories. And of course, one other thing that was um, mentioned was the attention to context and environment. So every time that we're dealing with the data or we're dealing with the research process in general, we have to have an attention to that, to the context and environment that the research is being conducted. Um, at, at the end of, of uh, each of our session, we uh, asked our participants uh, our attendees to submit their feedback to our session and to what the speaker uh, talked about in the session. And then we got a lot of positive feedbacks um, and also a lot of suggestions. So here is the sort of like a summary of all the feedback that we've got. Uh, but to further put them into categories, um, the first uh, is sort of they talk about what is lacking in um, the, the discussions uh, of open science and open research. Um, the first is uh, the intel intelligibility of open data and open research. What is open data and what is open research? A lot of people don't really know what that is. Um, and and as, as what Isabella said before, even a lot of um, the participants, they don't know what that is, right? If you say, do you want to open your data? They don't know what that means, but because of their trust, they, they say, oh yes, but yeah, but what does it really mean for you and for the participants? The second is the definition of sensitive data. Um, so what should be considered as sensitive is also needs to be sort of discussed and in the whole, uh, in the whole conversation. And the third is the lack of procedures and checklists in qualitative open research. And this specifically focus on qualitative research because a lot of the open uh, research or open science practice um, and guidelines focuses on quantitative research. And when qualitative research researchers want to find help, want to sort of uh, look for things that um, to support them, uh, they often cannot find any. So uh, we need to pay attention to uh, better support the quality of research researchers in the area. And the last point was really important, uh, which uh, was mentioned by a lot of uh, sort of um, PhD students, supervisors uh, that came to our uh, sessions. They said, uh, yeah, we do need a lot of information guidance in PhD supervision on open science and open research because either they haven't thought about it before, um, uh, they haven't talked about it with their uh, students, or they have never uh, they have never encountered situations where they uh, needed to mention this. So uh, in future, they say, they think in future sort of supervision meetings, it is quite necessary to give this option to their student as part of the uh, supervision process. The second uh, category is the improvements. Um, the first is the change of focus from quantitative research only. Uh, I have talked about this before. And the second is the neglected and sensitive areas in open research discussions and practices, uh, which we have covered uh, and try or tried to cover in this uh, event, uh, which was uh, the uh, doing research with vulnerable or marginalized group of people, because these group of people are uh, often neglected in the discussions of doing, uh, doing open research. And the third is the mental barriers of researchers who consider doing open research. Uh, yeah, these uh, 
sort of incorporates a lot of things. The first is um, the researchers are nervous about doing it. They don't know what the consequence would be, or uh, they are afraid of doing it because um, they don't know if they will pass the ethical uh, uh, ethical uh, ethic committee to do their research. And the third uh, is what I mentioned before, was that if they want to do it or if they're doing research with the marginalized group of people, then uh, they need better support for their own mental well-being. Uh, and the last, the last part uh, is the emphasis that sort of uh, highlighted in the feedback. The first, again, is the co-production and openness. Um, and the second is the first-hand consideration and concerns from the communities being researched. Basically, is we need to hear what the, what the our sort of research participants or the community uh, have to say in order to do our research. And the third is connected to that, which is the involvement of lived experiences and voices. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much both. Um, so we are, we've got one minute left, so uh, I'll just see if, Anybody has put any questions in the chat or the Q&A? No. So I had uh, one question for you, which I don't know how much you'll be able to <laughs> cover that in one minute. But um, one thing that, that occurs to me is that with the kind of current model that we have for, for data sharing, which is sort of, you know, put it in a data repository, in a data archive, um, and then it kind of sits there in perpetuity for reuses that, are often quite divorced from the initial purpose of the of, of the data collection, and how do you see how do you see uh, kind of overcoming that that barrier? Um, uh, particularly if you if you look at um, co producer research, you know how can we make sure that uh, research participants are kind of centered in any decisions about what happens to their data after the fact? You know, in the longer term. Yeah, so I think um, we are not the experts on the on the topic. I mean, our speakers were the were the expert ones. Um, we also are trying to understand and navigate it. Um, but I think um, what our speakers were talking about in the in the events uh, were really was really making sure that you have yeah that community input like really explaining that, okay, your data will be available in this repository like forever or making sure that there is an understanding of that. Um, I don't know what else can be done apart from that. I guess that is a very complex um, problem that should be um, more addressed and, and discussed, I guess, are, here are the challenges and, and limitations of, uh, of doing Thank that. Um, I've just seen we have uh, one question that's uh, coming through the chat. Um, so uh, do you have any comments on how to ensure context isn't lost um, when sharing qualitative data? Um, I think, I think again, that's also like, I think we don't like, we don't have a we don't have a solution to that because I think that's also a very important point, especially in the session with um, LGBTQ plus people. Uh, that is a consideration that we need to have when we're doing research. Um, so I think one of the one of the things that I can think of now is that, for example, if you're doing research with um, queer people, then there are a lot of the uh, sort of slants and also like their emotions that would deliver would be delivered during sort of performance or the style of speaking. And then that is the context of that data. But that context cannot be uh, cannot be like sort of shown in, you know, just 
in in the data uh, in the data in the database for people to see. So, um, yeah. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what could could be done to ensure that contact is not lost. Maybe I would think about like, oh, maybe we could learn from the film industry. For example, when we're doing transcriptions, we could add some sort of explanations or some like captions for. Uh, the situations the speakers were in at that moment. But yeah, I guess it's very, very much up for discussion. So if I can comment briefly about that as well. Something I think about as well is, is just, um, you can always contact the researcher, have a discussion, the, the original researcher have a discussion about it. Um, if there is possibility of doing that and also accept that you know your reinterpretation of a secondary data will have something lost in that because it's something that you are doing in your context so being able to dialogue with that uh, kind of knowing where that data came from uh, from what place of the world con contextualizing that data that original data but recognizing that you are interpreting it from a different context and a different, um, and being able to reflect about that in your research. I think that's an approach I would take. So I don't know if that fits well. No, yeah, you. that's a really interesting point. Just the the, the sort of acceptance of uh, the inevitability of that disconnect between researcher and subject, which is kind of uh, squared when you're thinking about secondary research. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we don't have any any more questions and it is uh, four minutes past um, our end time. So I will draw this to a close here. Uh, so yeah, just uh, want to say thank you very much, um, Isabella and Colin. That was a, a really fascinating talk. Um, and I'm really glad that uh, I got a chance to hear, hear about the um, uh, the other sessions that that you you did because certainly the first one that I went to was was fascinating. Um, when we put the uh, recording of this up, I'll make sure to link to uh, the recordings of the full seminar series, so people will be able to see all of this in context. Um, so thank you uh, very much to Isabel and Colin. I will just pop the link to the GW four. Um, uh, program up in the chat again, as I said, there's still time to register for some of the events later on this week. Um, so yeah, that is us done. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, um, and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye, everyone. Yeah.